and glory it never dies
I know it's not Christmas time, and I, I would really rather see you like, why is this really just on me? But um, we'll just bring it um, as we read and study and look and over and ponder it. And, uh, but right in the very beginning it says, uh, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree <coughs> from Caesar Augustus that all the world <coughs> should be taxed. And this taxing was the first made when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and the lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, his spouse wife, being great with child. And it was so that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is called Christ the Lord. And this sign shall be a sign unto you, and you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Amen. We're going to stop right there. If you would, go over to Matthew. They said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for this, for thus it was written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall a governor, for shall come, shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed to their own country another way. I hate to do this to you, but go back to Luke. <laughs> Sorry. Go back to Luke chapter 2. People today that say that we don't need the Lord anymore, um, people today say that you know, years ago, people were ignorant and unlearned and didn't really have anything. And people today will say that it was a myth that there's really nothing to it. But I want to try to show you here exactly what God's plan, um, if you look at this, exactly what, uh, how the, that this was brought to the people. Um, there's a lot of people that think today that only the rich, the benevolent, maybe the, the certain, uh, this certain church group or whatever, um, are going to be in heaven. There's going to be, the Bible says there's going to be people in heaven from every nation, every tongue, every creed, everything under the sun, there's going to be people there um, because that they have made preparation. 
But now in Luke chapter 2, we want to skip all the way down to verse number 8. Does anybody here know what would probably be one of the most lowly jobs that you could do? Shepherd. You think about it. They weren't really educated, Brother Stevie. They probably weren't the smartest people in town. Now, I'm not insulting anybody. Don't take this wrong. But some of the richest people in Ireland are sheep herders. Ireland has 70 million sheep. So I'm not making fun of that. I'm not saying that. I want to show you something here. But when God brought the message in the very beginning, okay, it says here, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Probably one of the, the simplest jobs in the world. You don't really do anything. You watch them, maybe scare off a wolf or a fox or something like that. But you can see here how that God brought the message to the very lowest of the low, I guess if you would, um, a class of people. But God doesn't want to leave anybody out. If you, amen, if you look today, amen. people, um, you know, they'll just back over there and eat acres ago, that little church, you know, we're Joel Holstein fans. We have a Starbucks in our church. Our pastor, like Brother Steve, he lives in a big old fine house, got lots of money. Oh, yeah, wife driving that new fancy car. That's the type of people we are. The Bible says that when I get all puffed up in my pride, <clears throat> and when I think I'm somebody or I've done some great thing, God resists that. Amen. I told a lady the other day, we were talking, and I said, everything you have, God gave to you. And I told her, doesn't the, Bible, doesn't the Bible plainly say that? Everything that you have was given to you. So why do I want, I'll pick on Jennifer here, why do I want to walk through the mall like this? You know, look what I got. And look what I've done in all these different things and stuff like that. But this message about this Christ child went out to probably the people that had like maybe the most insignificant job, probably just, you know, they could have been just young men out there that had no uh, fancy place, I guess you could, in society. My grandmother, my mom's mom, my mamma, uh, Flora Jericho, when she died, they buried her at the end of Cupridge Road. She just goes up on a hill. Been there? Been there? At the end of Cupridge Road, and there's a big, there's a little family cemetery up on the hill. And when she died, I thought to myself, Lord have mercy, how in the world are they going to do that? Now, what you saw was pretty cool, wasn't it? Nice road, right? And the cemetery was all done up and real nice and pretty. But back when my mamma died back in 1990, Brother Steve, you couldn't get up there. All right? So I come driving it off of Mountain Road, um, and I drove, and I turned, and I started looking, and I'm like, man, somebody's having a bad day. There was limbs everywhere, <laughs> Steve. There was limbs all over the road, broken all over the place. And the closer I got to the house, I thought, what in the world is going on here? And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, there was none of the roads were paved back then. And just like that, Brother Steve, it was all new stone. And you could see where the dad took graders down through there and graded that road. And everything, and, and all the trees and all that brush was come over. It was just a path, pretty much. And they cleared, but that's they cleared all that out. And they literally built a road a half a mile long to get up to that cemetery for a woman, brother, Longsworth, that never graduated from high school. I don't know if my grandmother ever had a ten dollar bill in her pocket. She raised thirteen kids, amen. But brother Steve, she had nothing, and she was not a member of society. She was not a highfalutin person, but she was just like those shepherds abiding in that field that night. But she had, did she have something or did she have something? Amen. She had somebody with her that was greater than all the politicians and the Donald Trumps and the Clintons and all these things. But she had a God that said a long time ago, I will provide your need. I will take care of you. I will do whatever I've got to do. The Bible says that I have a son, and if he asks me for a fish, will I give him a stone? Right, Brother Steve? Then he said, but how you being sinful, you know, your father is so much greater than that. But just like those shepherds abiding in that field one night, the Spirit of God, and I know it says in here the angels came, but somewhere along the line, the, the Spirit of God came to her and allowed her to have that opportunity to be saved. Amen. 
And then it says here, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way it was with my grandmother. That's all she ever talked about was things about the Lord. Amen? And the singing and stuff. She would sit there, and I'll never forget this because I got them in my cedar chest. For years she wore these same pink slippers and she'd sit in her chair and when we were singing about the Lord she'd tap her feet together like that. That's all she She never clapped. She'd tap her feet together. And so when she died, my mom said, is there anything of your mamma that you want? And I said, yes. What did I tell her? I want them pink slippers. Amen. So you can see today that they've got, they've got God, they've got the Lord, they've got the Spirit, they've got Him so uh, fancy, and they've got Him up in the big churches, and you've got to do this. My brother Martin told me, he, when he lived in uh, Salt Lake City, brother, when you came to the door, they checked what you were wearing before they let you in. Amen? And I said, what would happen, I mean, what would happen, basically, if a, a person came in and didn't have very good clothes? My brother Martin said, they turned them away at the door. Well, Jesus showed me. Yeah. yeah. Some long, some guy with you know hair and not maybe all done up nice and a robe and sandals on, and they would turn him away at the door. But what I'm trying to show you here is that people need to get back to this, and people need to realize this as we look at this that God sent the angels to go to a small group of probably some of the lowest people out there that society doesn't like. They don't look up to them. They're really nothing, or they're really nobody. And so basically appeared unto them and told them about something that one day after a while that it was going to be a savior or as soon as you know that he's born and in verse 10 it says and the angel said unto them, fear not for behold I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to only certain rich people is that what it says it says to all people I don't know what's wrong with people I got a lot of family members that used to always be in church Mark's out hunting today Somewhere along the line, he has lost that joy, realizing that that one day that that angel, that spirit came to his heart and he got saved. And uh, you know, the one time, Brother Steve, I'm just going to say it, the one time, probably about a week or two before he moved down to North Carolina, when he went into the Marine Corps and he went down there and stuff like that, he was standing right over there. And my Aunt Mary Lee was over there shouting, and there was some over here shouting over here. And he cut out and Mark preached for about 15 minutes. <laughs> He just tore the church up, buddy. I mean, God got a hold. What's that song? Something got a hold of me. God got a hold of him, buddy. He tore loose. And so I call him my Jonah. I think he's running. But this same angel was there, and he appeared to them, and he told these lowly shepherds. He's like, look, and he's in that city. He's over there. He is born, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And so they saw and the Bible says that they were sore afraid. Amen. But then it says in verse 12, this shall be a sign of you, shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothing, lying in a manger. They told him where he was. Brother Stevie, every time that you preach, when your dad preaches and everybody, don't they tell him exactly where the Lord's at? Where do they tell him that the Lord's at? He's right here. He's here. He is with us. He walks with us. If we'll have him, Brother Stevie always said, God's a uh, God's perfect gentleman. He won't force himself on us. And stuff, but we can see here where that he was there for the lowliest of the low, and that is me today. And like I said about my mamma, so I went to the funeral home, and there were some guys there from the county. And I'm like, How in the world did you guys get county approval, finance approval, to get the work job set up and do that in three days to build a road to a cemetery? And he said, We didn't need none of that. He said, That's that's Andy Markle's wife. What did she have in that town? The Bible says the greatest thing that you and I have is what? Our good name. Amen? Your name is worth more than what? Gold and silver. My mamma never had a thing. She had a few old dresses, a few old granny gowns, and those pink slippers that I have now. Amen? But she knew a God that was able, and she knew the Lord. And there was a lot of respect in that community for that family. <coughs> Amen? Now, let's go back just for a few minutes, back to Matthew chapter 2, and look at the second part of this. It said, Now, when Jesus was born, in chapter 2, verse 1, in Bethlehem of Judea, in the day of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? I saw a t-shirt one time that said, Wise men still seek him. Amen. 
And it said, For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Amen. Now, we're going to skip all the way over uh, to verse number 10. It says, And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child of Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now let's think about this. So the, the first part that we talked about was these poor, lowly sheep, uh, these shepherds abiding in their field. And now we've come to the great ones. Uh, I don't imagine that these wise men probably thought that they were great. But what I'm getting at is you're seeing a different class of people here. But when they went, okay, they said, We have seen his star in the east, and they are come to worship him. Amen. The thing is, today, people, that the, the wise of the world today, if you will, they're too good to worship. The wise people of the world today, they are too smart. They say that we don't need this. We don't need the Word of God. We don't need, well, they do call it the Word of God. They call it some type of a fiction or some kind of a fairy tale. But basically, we see here where that we have, on the other end of the scale, we see these three men, these wise men. Now, I know that you've seen the pictures of, you know, how they've got them all dressed up with robes and wearing crowns or whatever that they're wearing and stuff like that. But they're representative of, of like I said, a, a different class of people. But let's look at exactly what they did when they came. In verse 2 it said, saying, Where is he that is born the king of Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and have come and hang out with him? No. No. They came to worship him. So they were not too big. They were not too proud. They were not too high and mighty. No matter what they wore on the outside, they still came for one reason and one reason only, and that was to recognize him as the Son of God and to worship him. I was reading it the other day, or just kind of pondering and thinking about it, where the Bible says, consider the lilies, and it talks about how beautiful, you know, that they are. And it said, what does it say about Solomon? It said, even Solomon, in all of his greatness, in all that the money could buy, in all that his seamstress, and all that his people could come together to make him look great and wonderful, the Bible says, doesn't even compare to it, amen? What that God had made, the lilies of the valley, and then what man had made, he says there's no comparison to these two. But now we see these wise men that come from the east. The Bible said that they came with treasure. Okay, now we're going to, I don't want to talk about it here. We're not talking about that. Okay, now go down to verse 10. Now, it says in verse 2, they come to worship him. And number 10 said, and when they saw the star, why was that important? When they saw the star, what did that mean to them? They were there. They found it. Now I'm going to give you another stupid one. You can laugh at me if you want to. But I remember when I was a kid, we'd go down to Tennessee to my grandparents. Now, do you remember when we came up on the big hill there just before we went down to my grandparents out where the apple orchard on the left? I remember as a kid when we'd come up on that big hill. Next time we go, look at me. Next, we'd come up on the big hill there and just before the, the road dropped down to my grandparents. But I remember when we'd come up the hill like that, we'd get to the very top. You'd look way off in the distance and you could see the porch light out. And we knew we were home. So when those wise men came, and when they saw that the star had stopped and was over the place, they were home, if you will, if you want to look at it that way. But it said when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Now I didn't know this until your dad brought this out, but I didn't know that it took them three years. Is that right? Didn't it, wasn't it something like that? A real long journey for them? I mean, it was not like they walked from here up to the corner. It was a long journey for them to travel to get to that. You know, it was not like it was uh, um, whatever it was. Or your dad was telling me, apparently, he's uh, studied about that and about the, the traveling that they had done. But you're talking about great men. You're talking about wise men. No doubt people that look up to them. People, like I said nowadays, um, that, that have an education or they have a lot of money. Uh, or whatever the case may be, they just feel like, you know, we don't need to do this. So in verse 11 it said, and when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child of Mary, his mother, and again, what did they do? They fell down and they worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I was talking to somebody the other day about, um, we were talking about um, tithing and, and offering and, and doing things for the church and um, uh, different things of helping out financially and stuff like that. And it, well, it was my niece, actually, Savannah, we were talking about it. And we concluded that God doesn't need our money. 
I mean, he really doesn't. He, his, his pavement, his goal, he doesn't need our money, but he wants us to help, and he wants us to finance uh, things for the church and to do things for people. The Bible says that we should do good to them, especially the household of faith. So God wants us to help everybody, but especially our own. And uh, that's not being conceited or greedy uh, or having one person over the other. But, but the Bible tells us about this thing, that God loves um, a cheerful giver. I have people that I know right now that they'll pass the offering plate and they'll grudgingly put in a dollar bill. And you just see it all over their face. like, And they throw that in there. God doesn't want that. He wants us to be cheerful givers. So look what they did. They brought him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But let me ask you this morning. I was thinking about that as I was looking over this and, and just kind of pondering this week about, you know, this part of the scripture and everything like that. Let me ask you a question. What is it that we could give the Lord? Think about it. What could we possibly give him? A lot. Yeah. How many of you ever watched that show called Yukon Gold or something like that? Uh, or Bering Sea Gold? I watched that one whole season. Now I thought that when it got done at the end of the season, Brother Stevie, that these guys would come into that place with about two five-gallon buckets of gold and walk it like this back so much. The guy walks in and he's got a bag, Heather. Like if you went to Taco Bell and got like a, a couple of tacos and some cinnamon twists, that's all the bigger the bag was. And Brother Stevie, they had worked all summer, all summer long. And the guy come walking in, and I'm waiting for somebody to walk in with a big couple of big buckets of gold. So the guy walks up there, and I'm just going to show you something. I'm like, you know, I'm going to show you something right here. He walked in there, and the jar that he had in that bag was small enough to fit in this box, and you could one like that and had plenty of room. And he walked in there, Brother Stevie. And he goes like this, and the guy goes, Well, Larry, how'd you guys do this year? He said, We did real good. And he says, All right. And he goes, You got it? And he goes, Yeah. And he handed it to him. Seriously, he handed him that little bag. And he opened it up and he took the jar out. And it was about a small candle size. It was only like this big, and it was only about that deep, and it was full of gold dust. And I thought to myself, there were, Brother Stevie, they were working 10 and 12 hour days. And they walked in there with just that little bit of gold. And I'm going like this. I'm like, all right, where's the joke? What's the joke? Can you imagine that, Brother Stevie? Having a crew six and seven days a week, working 12 hours a day. And they walked in there, and that's all that they got, Brother Steve. That was it. Now it was worth $1.8 million in today's gold prices. But you think about that. Brother Stevie, you literally could have took that, walked out there in that yard and went just like that and never seen the gold again. But God, the streets of heaven are paved with pure gold that is transparent. These wise men, they gave him gold. He didn't need it. They gave him frankincense and they gave him myrrh. And these gifts that were given were there. But what gift? I've been thinking this has been driving me nuts all week. Amen. What can we give him to possibly make up for what that he did from that lowly shepherd, those boys are probably just kids, I would imagine, those lowly shepherds out there, all the way up to the benevolent, to the wise men and everybody in between. Amen. What is it that we could possibly give him, you know, that would ever measure up? And what did you say, Brother Stevie, what does he want? Just us. Amen. When you're out at the restaurant, when you're at work, or when you're in school and stuff like that, all he wants us to do is to talk about him. And you know, if you think about it, it doesn't take very long that you can bring, you know, the Lord into the conversation and you can talk about him. And I'll say this in closing. I was at the fire station and we had a garage fire. And Brother Steve, this could have got ugly. I think if it would have broke through that and got to the house, this, this really could have gotten really ugly. And I was standing there, you know, and I was telling the guys, and I said it like this, I said, well, I really thank the Lord that that we got a good knockdown on that. One guy's like, really? Oh my gosh, he goes, I was there. Was Jesus wearing his turnout gear? Because I surely didn't see him on the scene. And they always make fun of me. But that's what he wants, Brother Steve. Now you think about how lazy I am. You can say amen. <laughs> but you think about that, Brother Steve. We knocked that fire down in probably two or three minutes. We might have done a half an hour of overhaul 
and then we were pretty much out of there. It was not that big of a deal. But if it would have broke through that door and got into that house, you'd think of all the extra work that we would have done, all the extra danger, Brother Steve, that's in there, amen, all the things that are in there. But here again, it gave me an opportunity. And like I said, Josh, you don't have to sit there and give people no five-hour dissertation. You can tell them a simple thing. Yeah, my dad called me, went to the doctor, and I guess he just got a sore throat. He thought he might have had strep throat, and we ain't got no money to pay no five dollar prescription bill. And then you can say this, what would you say? And I and I thank God for that. Yeah. And you know, people look at you funny. But that's okay if they look at you funny. If you're in school, it's okay if they look at you funny and stuff like that. But continue to continue to continue to give God praise. The angels appeared under the shepherd and they told him about it, and then they went to the wise men. Not just the important, but God went to everybody. That was the plan, that everybody could be included in this if they wanted to. And I'm really struggling with this, and I, I'm sure some of you, I hope that you are too. But Brother Stevie, I don't understand why they don't want this. Do you? I can't figure it out. Can you? I cannot figure out why. Listen to what it says. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to here, they departed their own country another way. So many people are going out another way. And they are out there, you know, another way. You know, we were talking about my son, Mark. I hate to pick on him but he's because he's not here. But when he was working, one of the guys that he works with, his son fell out of a tree. He was, uh, I don't know if he was bow hunting or something. He fell out of a tree. Remember Mark talked about that? The 14-year-old boy, whatever. He fell out of the tree. And he got hurt real bad. And Mark kept telling that man that the church was praying for him. And kept telling him, kept telling him that God would make a way. And the boy actually ended up very, very good. Everything turned out great. That boy could have been killed. But they were afraid of this kind of problem, that kind of problem, and everything with that boy. And it was a great witness to him. Uh, I won't say any names, but me and Brother Steve, we know another guy that had been sick and, you know, prayed for him and different things like that. And God did a wonderful work. And so, but where are they today? I don't understand it, do you? I really have a hard time. But what we wanted to get to today was the fact that God has appeared to everybody. No one will have an excuse. The Bible says without excuse. But I'm so glad today that he appeared unto me. Amen. Aren't you? Everybody here say, everybody here say, amen. God appeared to you at one time. Amen. God appeared to you one time. And like I said, um, that you could be saved. But the Bible says he that endures until the end shall be saved. I think it's a good way, Brother Steve. I really do. I think it's a good way to be in. You know, uh, one time uh, I was in my school one time and we were gathering around, you know, looking at our lunch time, you know, lunch was over and uh, we we just had church. I mean, we, we, our teacher ended up sharing eating. Uh, she was a Christian and uh, she was in Oh, how I love Jesus, by every clean dishes. And uh, the rest of the students jumped in there and said, I said, we're not even in church, we're having, we're having a good time. <laughs> That's okay. I appreciate but, it. Uh, there was another time uh, uh, I had a shirt on and people got offended of it because it had a passion of the Christ. And he told me to put a name on It's not like that. Well, it's not like that. No. Can't you can't wear Christian wear all the time. You can't even uh, mention about Jesus without offending anybody. But you know what? Um, I'm glad I told some people about Jesus. I I I let them listen to Larry Russell and he and the, the bus driver Larry Russell teach and stuff, and he thought it was crazy. <laughs> But you know what? I didn't, I really didn't care because uh, uh, and I told me to do something. I I, I had to do it. All right, let's take a few minute break. Appreciate everybody's attention. Too bad, Josh. Oh, I'll change. Oh.